Hello and welcome to the World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Tracy Wolbrink, a pediatric intensivist at Boston Children's Hospital and co-director of Open Pediatrics. This video is part of an open pediatric series focused on pain management. I'm grateful to be joined today by Dr. Corey Chupatazzi. Dr. Chupatazzi is a pediatric emergency medicine specialist at Baylor College of Medicine and an associate professor of pediatrics. She's also the Associate Chief of Research at Texas Children's Hospital and has a passion for pediatric pain management and procedural sedation research, education, and quality improvement. She has served as a site principal investigator for the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, or PCARN, for several pain-related clinical trials and as part of the executive core for the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center. She recently led the development of two recently released pain management pediatric education and advocacy toolkits, and also led the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Committee of the American College of Emergency Physicians for two pain-related policy statements. Welcome, Dr. Chupatazzi. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolbrink. It's a pleasure to be here. So Corey, I thought you could start out by telling us how you got interested in the field of pain management. Thank you. So um, throughout my training, I was always interested in helping children alleviate pain and anxiety. And that was amplified as I came to train in a quaternary care hospital where our patients weren't the sickest in the department, but they were sitting for hours with pain and the fear of having that worst day of the life as they fall off the monkey bars and are rushed to the hospital. And so how might I be able to alleviate that in some way? That's great. And I wonder if you'd just tell us a little bit, you know, pain management is something that we as pediatricians are commonly facing and we take care of kids that are suffering from pain from many different causes. How big of a problem is this? And, and what are some of the key issues that you're thinking about right now? Yeah, great question. About 80% of our kids present in pain from an emergency standpoint. And so it is a large problem. Um, they have anxiety and fear. And so how do you tease that out and assess it? And then um, how do you treat it? For years, historically, we felt, thought that children didn't express pain. So um, in the neonatal period, we do procedures without um, pain medication or sedation. Um, and then we've seen this large um, vaccine hesitancy and everything from the painful experiences that they've had with immunizations and other things. So we really need to help alleviate pain in the younger age so that we can um, have a lifetime of um, options with pain management and procedures. That's interesting. And, and are there any major differences between the pain management in pediatric patients versus adult patients? Um, wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so there are definitely discrepancies between the uh, adult treatment of pain and children. We know that children do not receive pain medications at the same rate adults do. And in a recent study, we found significant differences in the ED um, as far as um, received in the, in the general ED versus children's hospital ED as well. Um, the pediatric ED had higher acuity and more admissions, yet for those painful procedures, time to pain medication was definitely um, faster in that pediatric ED um, compared to general ED. So, pain management can be delayed, um, and then access to that management. We know that a smaller percentage of patients are receiving pain medications as well, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, fear of, of medication dosing or, or lack of, of knowledge, um, and then also the thought that, that children didn't feel pain and that it might be quicker if, if um, you know, you just hold down the children, child and, and, um, and get the procedure done. And so, we know that all of those things have um, consequences down the line. Yeah, you mentioned an important point here, and that's, you know, how do we appropriately assess pain? And I think, you know, this comes up a bunch, and we've, we've talked with some other speakers around that. And uh, I'm curious, you know, how, how are you approaching the assessment of pain, and what are, you know, some of the current best practices that we can think about? Yeah, so pain assessment is really important. Um, and it's really important that you pick the right tool for the right age patient and the ability to assess. We know that parent report versus nursing or physician report is different than how the child reports. So we do look to self-reported pain scales as that gold standard um, if the child is able. And then um, think about all of those factors that weigh in. So for example, a, a nurse might say, oh, 
I don't want the child to be addicted to pain medication. Let's not, not treat or the physician doesn't want to give too much in a young child. Um, while we know that Prescani scores are, are tied to, to some of the pain metrics um, and pain treatment. And so, um, and, the, and all of that while the child's just sitting there saying, I hurt. Um, and so how, how can we take all of those perspectives and really just get the child the appropriate amount of pain medication? In addition, I do think pain reassessment is important. So just like um, with patients with diabetes, you don't um, have a high sugar and give them insulin and not check another sugar. Same thing with pain reassessment. If we're given medications, we really do need to reassess those patients and make sure that their pain is trending downward, that they're in a place um, where they're comfortable and, and settled. So uh, we can't forget pain reassessment in addition to, to the tools in place to, to assess pain in the first place. And what does the literature say in terms of, you know, the pain scales, um, what's been shown in, in terms of, you know, how, which ones should we be using? Are there, is there any recommendations to which ones perform better or that we should sort of be incorporating into our practice? Yeah, so the fa FACES pain scale revised is one of the most widely recommended um, by the International um, Council on Pain. But however, um, I've really been liking the stoplight pain scale over the last little bit. Um, it is validated um, and we'll provide those references for you, but it um, goes from just the three things that you'd wanna do. So green is go, I'm good, I don't need any additional pain medication, to that yellow, uh, I'm, I'm doing okay, but come back and reassess. And that red, no, I'm in pain, I need something now, um, uh, let's get, get moving. And so um, I think it's a very user-friendly tool to really get at what needs to be done from that follow-up action as well, because I think it gets a little bit tricky um, with the policies for treating mild or moderate pain based on numbers. Um, and so really just wanting to get the appropriate um, medication to the child to treat that pain. Excellent. Well, thank you for walking us through a lot of these crucial issues and how we can begin to use some of these tools to assess pain. And I think that brings me up to a really important point. And that one major area of focus of yours is education and training. And you recently led the development of the pediatric education and advocacy kits focused on pain management. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what these are, how healthcare professionals can access them, and, uh, and why they might be useful? Yeah, great question. So this is really exciting. The Emergency Medical S Center for Children Innovation and Improvement Center is a grant funded by the Health Research Resources and Services Administration within the government um, to create education for all levels of, of care for children, emergency care. And so we've been developing these PEAK toolkits so that pediatric education and advocacy kits really to um, transform care and to have a one place, one stop shop for best practice. We've partnered with Trek Canada, which is translating emergency knowledge for kids to ensure those guidelines and bottom line recommendations are applicable to kids across North America. So from a pre-hospital standpoint to hospital-based care um, and, and beyond. And so one of our toolkits is, is our pain toolkit. So we've developed that bottom line recommendation but not only that, have a podcast series as well, talking about, about pain management strategies, and then talk about some modalities that, that might be helpful as we'll get into. So intranasal fentanyl is really helpful um, for quick pain medication, especially in that pre-hospital setting, but in the ED as well for increasing timeliness. So there's a video about um, intranasal administrations, um, and other tools that are helpful for not just the um, physicians, nurses, advanced practitioners, but also for the families and, and their advocates. That's really great. I was wondering if you could potentially walk us through a little bit of, of the kind of information um, that's included. You started touching on a couple of elements here, but you know what, what would someone expect to see as they went to this toolkit um, and what kind of information might they find? So our bottom line recommendations are created to ensure that from arrival, the needs of the child are, are put into place. So how can we create a family-centered environment that can kind of decrease the noise as much as you can from an emergency standpoint, try to um, take care of, of splinting or um, soothing me measures to as adjuncts to whatever painful condition might present, 
and then to work through the algorithm for how to, to assess mild and moderate pain. And so that's where we really feel strongly that um, picking an uh, ibuprofen or acetaminophen um, is a great first line and then adding that other agent on on top for, for painful conditions. And then um, when needed, escalating to that, that opioid medication as well. You know, historically codeine was one of the most um, frequently utilized medications um, across the country and, and, and Canada as well. And we've really seen that um, due to that genetic variability and uh, um, activity with the hepatic enzymes, it's, it's lots of consequences with having no effect to high sensitivity um, and significant side effects and, and complications and mor morbidity. So the um, American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Drugs did put out that policy statement um, several years ago now to say, just say no to codeine. So just as a public service announcement, please don't, don't prescribe codeine. Um, and then um, tramadol use only in the, the older population as is recommended by the Food and Drug Administration. One of the considerations we added, as we said, we're trying to ensure that, that the toolkit is available to all um, hospitals everywhere, community providers um, and such that is thinking about IV access can be very challenging in kids. It can be very challenging from a pre-hospital standpoint in a bumpy ambulance. And so um, one of the, the tools and resources we added was for uh, the consideration of intranasal fentanyl. So that's, um, there's a video on how to administer in the nose that is um, very easy. It does not burn like some of the other intranasal medications. And so that is a really great adjunct over the last um, 10 years that has transformed pre-hospital care as well as emergency care for getting pain medication on board for, for children with special health care needs and difficult IV access, as well as our patients in general um, when our resources are stretched to their capacity. That's great. I love, you know, the um, focus on family-centered care and sort of bringing the team-based approach together because, you know, it really takes the whole team to manage these patients properly. And I'm curious, you know, um, we're super fortunate to be chatting with you as one of the leads in the development of this toolkit. What were some of the, the conversations that you as a group um, had as you were creating these toolkits? What were some of the challenges that you were, that you were grappling with? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the opioid crisis. Um, we hear a lot about, you know, a whole, whole host of issues related to pain management. What were some of the things that, that your group had considered and, and how did you reconcile those? Yeah, and I think the difference for me in, in doing these toolkits on the national level is ensuring that there's um, recommendations are in line with things that are available to all patients. So sure, we might have access to some things at a quaternary care center, but all of those, those resources might not be involved. So we really reached out to the stakeholders and received feedback. And so there's an opportunity to, to provide feedback online from anybody who, who would like to give us feedback um, through a, a, a feedback process. And so that's really instrumental in making sure that, that the recommendations we're putting out there are available. So for example, there are some formulations that might, might not be available in, in Canada or in different rural communities um, or that might need to be compounded, then those were less helpful to put on the guidelines. And so we really tried to make it um, apply to 80% of the population and with recommendations that would be applicable to all. Similarly, I do think um, things like child life specialists, if, um, if you have access to those are, are extremely important um, as far as um, providers who have ex um, extensive training in helping children deal with stress and working through their painful situations. But there are a lot of things and resources and tools available for those that, that don't have that. For example, um, smartphones and, and um, tablet computers have been really helpful in having the child play their favorite song or doing look and find games and helping with the distraction that has been so important and proven to help um, with adjustment. So those kind of resources too, we, we provided some links or, or um, resources. And then there's some very great videos as well um, as far as what, what, what it might look like when they get to the ER and, and how to advocate for different medications for IV placement. So there's a variety of tools um, and trying to 
make it um, finite uh, enough, but um, but really quali high quality tools that we think would be applicable to, to the best public. That's great. And I love the approach of making sure that all the equipment that's in there is applicable, you know, in the pre-hospital hospital sort of setting, um, not necessarily everything applicable in all those environments, but very reasonable approach to kind of uh, your recommendations. Um, I'm wondering if you could potentially walk us through, um, you know, how, how a provider might potentially use this with a real patient that's coming into, you know, let's say the emergency department or something. How how might this be be utilized? So, say um, the child falls on the playground, and you get that frantic call at work that you need to go pick up your child, and his arm looks mangled, and so you're, you're, you're all those things are going through your mind as you're as you're getting anxious, and you're going to get your child. Um, and you get there and pick him up and whisk him to the emergency um, department where then you might have to wait for a little bit. So the, the algorithm starts with um, those initial techniques to try to, to soothe and calm um, the patient, to try to splint the extremity if it's, a, it's a fall that was there, to get some ice on before we can do the imaging that's necessary to evaluate what we might need to be. And then as we get to what pain medications based on their pain level, we can start to walk through those. So for mild pain, um, we talked about a little bit about that ibuprofen or acetaminophen as your starting point. And then for um, moderate pain, layering on some of that opioid medication. Um, we know from a study of Hercher et al. Um, that once um, the patients had milder or had more moderate pain, that from a survey of, of emergency providers as well as orthopedic physicians, that then opioids were the treatment of choice. And so trying to get those on board. Fantastic. So you mentioned opioids here. There is obviously a lot that's uh, in the news and in the press right now about the opioid crisis. Um, what, what, what evidence do you have to share us about um, what what does this uh, look like for pediatrics and any recommendations that you might be able to offer us for using op opioids appropriately for children? Yes, yeah, so I think opioids definitely are needed for severe pain and we want to treat the pain in children. So the pendulum has swung a little bit from um, you know pain being that 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 sixth vital sign and then we are able to um, really treat the treat the pain and manage that to now thinking about oh have we are we are we giving out too many opioids are we creating addicts and those kind of things so our purpose in creating a statement from the american college of emergency physicians was really to say start with your non-opioid medications there's the variety of adjuncts um, to choose from as well but we really are saying that opioids are necessary in many cases um, and then when we use them, we need to be responsible with that. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, we need to check the um, drug monitoring program um, in your state or, or your local area to make sure that um, the family and the child um, is not um, utilizing opioids inappropriately and then do safe prescribing. So um, prescribe the amount that they need to get through the acute process. We know that for fractures, for example, once they're splinted and have the ice on board and good and anti-inflammatories, they really don't need um, that much, many days of, of opioid medication. So limiting those prescriptions to less than three days, um, providing information on safe disposal so that, that families are able to dispose of that medication when it's not needed, um, such to prevent di diversion and, and future problems. So lots of ways to... Um, be safe with opioids and they provide a lot of opportunities for great quality improvement projects in, in, your, in institutions. Another really important issue that is uh, of grave importance right now is, is how do we promote um, optimal health equity, especially in the situation where we are caring, with, caring for patients that have disparities. And I know that you've been doing a lot of work in this area. And so I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about the work um, that you've been doing and what you and your team have been exploring in this domain. Yeah, so we can't talk about pain management without talking about those disparities. So we know across the board there's been disparities in, in pain assessment um, in, um, in um, minoritized youth, um, as well as then um, administration and, and then 
prescriptions as well. So for example, um, Dr. Boyle has done a, a extensive um, work in this area as well. And so through a, a study through PCARN, our Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, um, we looked at that race and ethnicity prescriptions over time at four of our, our large pediatric emergency rooms. Um, and we see that over, over the years, from 2012 to 2019, the, the opioid rate and prescriptions have gone down dramatically. Um, however, we do notice that, that there still are differences between that, um, that top line where it's the non-Hispanic white um, patients receiving um, more more opioid prescriptions versus that bottom line, which is um, non-Hispanic Black patients. So um, still differences in prescribing, in time to treatment, um, and that's been played out in several um, studies across abdominal pain, appendicitis, tooth pain. So we just really need to think about um, implicit bias. How are we um, doing as a department and really look at those metrics on, on pain management. It's great that, you know, the first step to figuring out how we solve a problem is to identify that this problem exists and, and understand the magnitude of that. And I thank you and your colleagues for, for your work in this area. I'm wondering, you know, related to that, um, how, you know, do you have any practical solutions? You know, you mentioned implicit bias and, um, you know, I think we all are hopefully reflecting on the care that we're delivered and the way that we're managing patients and, you know, doing a lot of training to try to reduce this. But I wonder, are there, you know, what, what are some of the suggestions or recommendations or discussions that um, individuals such as yourself are having um, to provide the best recommendations for, for all of us to improve our care in this, this area? And I think we're learning, right? I think, like you said, the first step is admitting there's, there's a problem and a difference and looking at that data. Um, Dr. Tiffany Johnson out of um, UC Davis looked at a study of residents. So we knew um, with implicit um, bias against black adults in general was present. She looked at pediatric residents and there was actually um, still implicit bias against black children. Um, and so that is concerning how do we try to foster um, growth and development such that um, we can break down the um, uh, structural racism that is, is prevalent throughout our institutions um, and, and really um, acknowledge those and put some time and effort and resources into ensuring that um, uh, our, our workforce has the appropriate training to, to mitigate um, those biases. So we're coming um, up to the close of this uh, session, and I'm hoping that you could just kind of give us your key takeaway points, um, things that you want us all to make sure we remember from this video. Yeah, so in summary, pediatric pain should be assessed and treated. And so use a scale, get familiar with it, and use it for pain reassessment after medications. I think start with acetaminophen um, and, and ibuprofen, and then add whichever agent hasn't already been given, and then layer on opioids as needed. Consider intranasal fentanyl for those moderate to severe pain or for difficult to access with IVs and, and timeliness administration. And then share in that opioid stewardship. Have those conversations with the family. Check the prescription monitoring program to mitigate misuse. Um, and then prescribe less than three days um, unless they're, they're a, a standard established patient for chronic pain. And then provide information on storage and disposal resources because we all share in the responsibility for eliminating that race and ethnic um, bias in pain management. And so um, we can all work together to, to improve pain management in children. Well, thank you so much for all that you've done for uh, the field of pain management and for sharing your pearls of wisdom and key takeaways. And, you know, I wanted to just, um, just commend you because I think it's so important for us to ensure that the care that we deliver is fair and equitable to all of our patients um, and bringing this to light and making this problem known is going to pave the way for us to think about strategies that we can improve that in the future. And in addition to you know, this area, which I, I think is going to grow a ton in the next uh, few years, I'm wondering what other topics or domains do you see um, as likely to emerge or key points that we're probably gonna be talking about and thinking about over the next five years? 
so I think additional topics clearly at the forefront on, of everybody's mind is the mental health crisis. So we do have a mental health um, toolkit as well that provides resources with suicide screening and many of our resources linked to collaboratives ongoing through the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Emergency Physicians, the Emergency Nurses Association, all our partners with the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center to really improve care across the continuum. And so um, those are some big toolkits, the child abuse and child maltreatment um, toolkit, as well as, as, as things that, um, you know, scare people. So seizures from a family identification and management and, and moving on, all those types of toolkits are, are, are great resources um, and there's great information there. And we would love your help. So there's uh, opportunities to provide feedback, but also opportunities to get involved through a scholars program and fellows program to explore different opportunities of um, emergency care across the continuum and get involved in these, these programs to get a mentorship and do projects. And so if podcasting or um, op-eds or um, toolkit building is an interest, definitely um, get, get involved. I love your emphasis on advocacy and getting involved. And, you know, on a personal note, it seems like you found your passion and you've been incredibly successful in pursuing it. Um, you're truly a leader in the field and the work that you and your team has done is likely to impact the care of a lot of patients. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for trainees or junior, junior faculty who are looking to start their careers either in pain management or in other uh, topic areas that they're interested in, and any pearls that you can offer on how to be successful as you begin a career um, in academic pediatrics. Yeah, so the sky's the limit. I think especially in academic pediatrics, everybody is just so nice and welcoming. And if you have enthusiasm and interest, um, reach out. I think um, we all feel a little bit of a imposter syndrome and you know, you don't want to email this pain expert, um, but that's definitely what I did at, at the national meetings. I'd see they were speaking um, and asked to set up some time. And I think um, really wanting to, to pave the way. We know schedules are crazy for um, learners at all levels um, and that, that you might not be, it might not be the right time for the right project, but I think reach out, get involved and, um, and continue to, um, to, to keep trying, because I think that um, uh, you'll be able to find that. Um, I was someone who definitely didn't have um, uh, met in mentorship specifically in this field at my institution. And so I looked, looked outside and so definitely reach out. Well, Corey, thank you so much for speaking with me today and for sharing your insights and your incredible resources with the community that are working together to optimize pain management in children. I think these are going to be incredibly valuable, um, and we will make sure that the resource um, URL is included um, alongside of this video. So thank you again. Thank you so much and continue to go forward and stamp out pediatric pain.